So this uh, is a quick little animation that kind of puts some of this together. Um, here on top we have a master transmitting at some specific channel period. And then a slave comes along and it goes into search mode. So it's duty cycling, it's radio on and off, trying to find the packet. As soon as it finds that first one, it'll then adjust itself and only receive at the channel period. So as I mentioned before, in order to actually, in order for the slave to actually find the master, it needs to have some pieces of information. It's gonna to need to know what the network key is, it's gonna to need to know what the RF frequency is, and it's gonna to need to know what the channel period is. And this stuff is easy, because within AND Plus, this is all defined for you in uh, the device profile. So you can very easily hard code this into your application on the slave side. Now, ideally, it also knows what the channel ID is. And the channel ID is made up of three different parts. First of all, there's a device type that's a single byte value, and the device type identifies what type of device you're, you're talking to. So this is another value that gets defined by the ant plus device profiles. So for example, this information would tell you whether you're a heart rate monitor or a bike speed and cadence sensor or a blood pressure cuff. And your application can determine based on that information whether this is a device I even want to start talking to. There is another byte reserved for transmission type. Um, there's really no good definition for transmission type. Basically, transmission type is there to define how the data within the ant packet is actually defined. And luckily, transmission type isn't something that's, uh, that actually changes a whole lot. Um, I believe there's only one value currently defined for transmission type. But it is another one of these values that's defined by ant plus and by the device profiles. And then there is a two-byte device number. And the device number should ideally be unique across all different devices that exist. So this is a number that you need to define, you need to set in your application. And you can either make it random or you can have some kind of a process where it increments with each device that you get out the door. Short story is, is that this is, device, or this is a number that um, the slave will not necessarily know. So what happens if the slave doesn't know what that channel ID or that device number is? And in those situations, we need to do something called pairing. And pairing is simply the process of acquiring the channel ID, or it's the process of a slave acquiring the channel ID from a master device. And there are different techniques that, are, that, are, that exist for pairing. The simplest one is to simply set um, or your, all your channel ID parameters, or the channel ID parameters that you don't know, to zero, to a wildcard. And in that situation, your slave device is simply gonna connect to the first device that matches all the rest of the channel ID parameters that you set, and also matches the network key and, and the RF frequency. And this technique works really well if you're in an isolated environment. So if you're in a situation where there are no other transmitters outside of the one that you're actually trying to connect to. Unfortunately, that's not always the case. Um, typical examples of that would be, um, for example, in a gym or uh, in a doctor's office where there are a lot of different transmitters that you may potentially accidentally connect to. So we, we have added uh, some mechanisms to try to get around that problem. And I'm not gonna get into too much detail as to what these actually are, uh, partly because they're covered in other presentations that you're gonna see over the next couple of days. But uh, I'll just give you a quick description of what some of the mechanisms are. Um, pairing bit is a neat one. In pairing bit, you can actually specify uh, a bit within the channel ID that indicates that this device is in pairing mode. So this allows you to eliminate other devices in the area, provided that those other devices are not also trying to pair. The big disadvantage of this one, and the reason it really hasn't been adopted all that much in, uh, in the market, is because it requires some kind of a user interface on both the master and on the slave to put the device into pairing mode. And that, obviously, especially with sensors, is not always an option. Uh, buttons and, and things like that are fairly expensive. And of course, it introduces another element that your user will need to um, do properly. They're gonna need to put both devices into the proper mode in order for them to connect.
Proximity is another mechanism that we've introduced. Um, proximity actually works really well. And the, the whole uh, concept behind proximity is just the ability to pair to a device, the closest device uh, to the one you're actually trying to connect to. Okay, so what happens if you get a whole bunch of AND channels and you put them all in the same room, all transmitting uh, close to each other? How do you ensure that those devices are going to coexist with each other? How are you, you going to ensure that they do not overlap and interfere with each other? And that problem, that particular problem set, is referred to as coexistence. And it's actually a problem that all the different wireless protocols out there have. Um, and a lot of them get around it in different ways. Unfortunately, a lot of them don't. And they have the problem of coexistence, and you're actually not able uh, or capable to run uh, a lot of channels in the same room. Now, strictly from a probability point of view, and has a lot going for it. As you could probably tell from some of the earlier diagrams that I did, AMP manages its channels in the time domain. And these diagrams are not, uh, not to scale. You actually got a lot of room in those channels to, uh, to transmit data. And chances are that you're not going to be transmitting at the same time as somebody else in the room. And in an ideal world, uh, with perfect devices, that would almost work. Unfortunately, our devices are not ideal, and we use something known as clocks on all, uh, on all our devices. So even if you happen to start up your network, and you're, you're in an environment with a lot of channels, and nobody's on top of each other initially, you are eventually going to drift into each other, and uh, coexistence becomes an issue as devices start to interfere with each other. Luckily, in Ant, we actually implemented a very neat algorithm um, that gets around this. And this is where that concept of adaptability comes in, and that key word in the definition I gave you of adaptive. Ant will actually detect encroaching channels in its little uh, Rx window that it opens up after the transmit, and then adjust its timing automatically to move out of the way. And it does this without losing synchronization to its slate, and it's completely seamless to the user. So the effect of this is that you can go from having about 10 devices operating uh, in, the, in the same proximity without air to more than 300 devices. So this is a little, uh, another little animation that goes over that concept. Here you have two masters. The master on the top starts transmitting. So it it's, does a transmission followed by an RX window. And then you have another master that starts transmitting beside it. And you can see initially they're not interfering with each other. But unfortunately, with time, they drift into each other. And that drift is captured by the RX window of the first master. So the first master will actually move out of the way automatically, completely seamless to your user and your application. Okay, so the whole point of, of having wireless links and creating and channels is to transport data. And as I mentioned in an earlier slides, there are three types of data that Ant supports. Broadcast, acknowledged, and burst. All these message types are fully bidirectional. So for each uh, message type that the master can send to the slave, the slave can also send back to the master. So I'm just going to go through each of these and kind of show you what the mechanics uh, what the mechanics are at the, at the channel level. Uh, broadcast messages are messages that do not get any acknowledgement. They are basically the default for the master endpoint. So this is when you open a, a master channel, this is the message that gets sent in order to synchronize the channel. It is also the only type of message that's available on a transmit only channel or a unidirectional channel, I think for obvious reasons, uh, because it's broadcast in one direction, there's no opportunity to receive a response. There's eight bytes of data per message payload for each broadcast message that gets sent. And these types of uh, messages are ideally suited for um, sensor applications. So for applications where the data does not actually change very fast, and where it's not really important to get every single packet of your transmission. So for example, a heart rate uh, monitor is a good example of this where getting every single and acknowledging every single data packet is not really that important. What's really important is to get the latest information 
So if you happen to go through some interference, it's a lot more valuable to have the last data packet than to have a history of, of the data that you lost. And if you look at our current device profiles, you'll find that most of them define broadcast message type um, of devices. So I think you've, see, you've pretty much seen this diagram before, a broadcast channel. This is a, a bi-directional broadcast channel. The master sends a transmission packet followed by uh, an RX window, and the slave just synchronizes to each transmission of the master. So that's just a master to slave tra uh, transmission over here. If, if the slave needs to send a message to the master, it'll only do so if required by the host application. And it'll do that immediately after, follow, uh, after receiving a message from the master. So the slave is gonna receive that, or sorry, the master is gonna receive the message from the slave in its RX window. This is the window that it uses also for coexistence purposes. So in order to compensate for that, the master is gonna open up another RX window so that it can still detect any encroaching channels. So a key point that I wanna, I wanna point out in this slide is that it takes a lot less power to send a message from the master to the slave than it does to send a message from the slave to the master, simply because you're turning the radio on for a lot longer than you are in the other direction. So while it is possible to send uh, just as much data from the slave to the master, because you can do that for every single message that you receive from the master, you really need to consider what kind of uh, a power hit you're gonna take and whether your power budget allows for that. 